welcome to another episode of Architect Tomorrow. For those that are new to the podcast, Architect Tomorrow is very much um, a community and a series of episodes that discuss architecture and related disciplines like technology transformation. And so what I should say before we go any further is that this episode, as most of the episodes are, are not the official views of any of our current or previous employers. They're our own sort of personal thoughts on and ideas on what we think organisations need to be thinking about in the space of AI uh, you know, when it comes to sort of architectural challenges. And so specifically, just to kind of provide a bit of context, we're not really going to be talking too much about the models themselves, model development and model architecture itself. We're kind of zooming out a level and thinking about, right, when you've got a model that you're happy with, and we'll perhaps touch a little bit on MLOps in, in a moment, once you've got a model you're happy with, how do you then integrate that into um, you know, the, the organisation in a way that manages risk, that manages privacy, manages technical challenges, because this new innovative technology has lots of potential benefits, but there are risks and challenges to sort of, you know, uh, navigate around. And so with that, I'd like to sort of uh, kick us off with, with intros. Um, perhaps Charles. I'm uh, Executive uh, Director with um, JP Morgan Chase. So I'm the uh, SME for uh, uh, AI and uh, ML innovation. Before that, uh, I've worked with the uh, semiconductor industry. I've uh, worked with the uh, space and defense um, uh, industry, um, finance before, uh, storage um, uh, infrastructure, and um, many other like R&D um, uh, industries. So I came from uh, hardware development, okay. then uh, moved into uh, software systems, and uh, then uh, did my PhD with, uh, where I actually looked at uh, humanoid uh, robotics. So that's combining all those uh, factors and uh, mechatronics uh, if you want to, uh, to add to it. So I always uh, work at the confluence of uh, software and, uh, and um, hardware. Okay. And this is also the area where you've got a lot of uh, data and uh, data processing and you have to actually be clever about uh, how you handle data, how you handle a lot of data. And uh, also you have to worry about things like uh, the, the compliance of the mm -hmm. system in terms of the hardware conformance and also software conformance and then the uh, interaction with the uh, people that you deal with. So that's the brief uh, yeah. uh, journey. Brilliant. And so Chris, if I can go to you next. Sure, Chris Booth. I'm a product owner at uh, NatWest Group, um, focusing primarily on Cora, which is the bank's conversational AI agent. Um, uh, primarily looking at machine learning, immersion technologies, and how we can improve Core's intelligence performance to serve our customers better. Uh, before that, I started out in the Royal Air Force, so six years uh, as a software engineer, doing innovation and integration engineering for uh, the Eurofighter Typhoon and other aircraft. So that's like designing and figuring out how to implement new technologies onto much older hardware. Um, always a fun challenge. Uh, I ran my own startup after that. Um, I said earlier looking for stability, that's not true at all. <laughs> <laughs> More like local stability. Um, consulted for a, a small agency, AI agency, and then moved to Cora, which is even today. Um, my particular focus interest is um, a bit of ML ops, LM ops we'll touch on now, conversation AI, um, but mo most importantly, these language models are showing amazing performance, but how do we cover the weaknesses? especially around governance and the clients you mentioned, so looking forward to it. Thanks, Chris. James? Uh, yeah, so I'm James Hewitt, I'm a solution architect at ScotLogic um, for the last um, about six years, uh, working primarily in, in traditional IT, in architecture, in financial services and uh, public sector. Uh, prior to that, I, I worked at JP Morgan for a while and ran uh, the, the mm -hmm. trade derivatives team there in uh, out of Glasgow. And um, prior to that, I was um, I ran a startup um, which was heavily involved in machine learning. So uh, I, I did AI as a degree, and I worked as a um, machine learning researcher, primarily in automated behavior analysis. I then spun that out um, from Edinburgh University um, into a startup and ran that um, for a few years. So I've got a bit of a background in machine learning, and then more recently, traditionally in uh, in kind of enterprise architecture. Um, and technical architecture. So I guess this is kind of the confluence of those two things coming together and now looking at how we you know, productionize some of the, um, the more cutting edge uh, kind of AI techniques uh, mm -hmm. into enterprises. And whilst I don't normally introduce myself, I guess it's worth perhaps giving you a little bit of context about my AI experience. So I studied a fair bit of AI in my degree, um, which is longer ago than I care to talk about. I thought it was a couple of decades ago, but anyway, uh, <laughs> moving swiftly on from that. Um, more recently, when I was at a, a big consultancy, 
we were um, working out how to take machine learning models that were detecting fraud and scale that to run through um, you know, years worth of audio recordings. So we're talking you know, years and years of audio uh, and trying to scale that up and you know, do that cost effectively but also manage the risk and the compliance. So that, that was you know, about four or five years ago now, maybe a bit longer. So that's where I kind of started to really start thinking about this challenge of how do you how do you really scale AI um, or machine learning? Um, I know AI is a bit of a sensitive term. I pro probably prefer intelligence <laughs> augmentation if we're going to get sort of pedantic about it. Um, but anyway, let's let's talk a little bit about what we're going to cover here. So we're, we're talking about you know machine learning and how we deploy that into large um, enterprises. So you know generally that's an organisation a fairly typically a fairly complex organisation, right? We're not really in startup territory. Startups can generally get away with doing things because the regulator isn't so worried about them being a big risk. Um, clearly, if they're in a regulated sector, they probably need to think about some of these things a bit more. Mm -hmm. But often, startups can be very agile, very nimble. We're talking about situations where you've got existing legacy infrastructure or you know, existing contemporary infrastructure. Mm -hmm. How do you sort of integrate the data you know, and, and the systems and the processes? Um, you know, and therefore, these things need governance and sort of guide rails. And so, given that that's quite a, you know, a there's quite a lot of challenges there, it's quite a headache, there's quite a few risks to navigate, why would organisations even sort of wants to, to do that, Charles, right? What's the benefits to, to the organization of really you know, deploying machine learning successfully? I think, uh, I mean, the, the, the first part is um, we cannot actually start with uh, machine learning as the solution, right? So we need to actually start with uh, business uh, problems and then they need to grow into whatever solution uh, pass uh, that we take, yep. but uh, one of them might be uh, machine learning. Mm -hmm. So if you take, for example, that uh, in order for you to actually go through compliance, you have to actually deal with, I mean, a lot of documents and all those documents have to be correct right and or you're looking at contracts right setting up a contract and you cannot actually get anything uh, wrong in there or something that will, that will actually come back to I mean uh, to bite you but there has to be a human being at some point who has to actually summarize all those documents or understand those documents because right. even if you put uh, your machine learning model on there it will not reason on what it mean, what it is that uh, that it is actually reading. It can do a good sum uh, summarization, can do entity recognition, etc. But it will not give you the uh, I mean the actually the uh, the cracks of the policy that uh, that you're dealing with, mm -hmm. or the cracks of the I mean, of the contract that I mean that you're dealing with. Right? Yeah. So in order to actually minimize that uh, I mean the um, I mean the chances of making mistakes, you've got companies uh, I mean uh, getting into these uh, uh, into this domain in order to actually summarize. Uh, uh, documents and also you've got uh, places where you've got sensitive data you don't want that sensitive data to actually reach the, the, uh, the outside world so mm -hmm. you need to actually capture that I mean, that uh, sensitive data so if you've got all these documents that you're looking at how do you know that there is actually uh, I mean, profe I mean uh, uh, personally identifiable data within that or mm -hmm. any other sensitive material within that so if you can actually use AI to actually quickly zoom in on those I mean, on those parts and mm -hmm. look at the context around it, build right. a graph of I mean of, uh, of knowledge around it, then you can actually navigate that I mean, that uh, knowledge graph and make decisions based on that. So that is actually uh, one aspect. But for the most part, the question is actually I would say it's such a very uh, very uh, generic. Mm -hmm. So I would take it like uh, let's say if you got a uh, a manufacturing um, uh, industry let's say you actually uh, you've got a production line inspection right you start with okay let's I mean, let's, uh, I mean, let's zoom in at, I, mean, I mean on the components how are they I mean are they uh, are they uh, uh, placed on it and we are actually using big machines to automatically place these I mean, these uh, components and if you can actually place it accurately how about reading it back accurately so that we know and confirm that this is actually I mean, this is uh, uh, this is uh, placed uh, correctly? Now, if we can actually move at speed, then we start leaving humans behind. We okay. need a machine to actually mm -hmm. make those decisions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's quite interesting. I think there's there's like two broad cases there. I think isn't there? One of them is augmentation of human or business Keep processes with mm -hmm. humans in the loop. Mm -hmm. So it's allowing humans to be more efficient. Yeah. and focus where they need to focus and taking some of the kind of toil away and automating it. Yeah. And the other one is actual replacement of human actors mm -hmm. to, an hour, to enable scale or cost reduction or, or whatever. So there's maybe like two broad classes of, um, yeah. of benefit. Exactly, yeah. yes. Yeah. And so there's a um, machine learning model at the moment that's getting a lot of attention and a lot of headlines, right? 
And so, Chris, I want to turn to you because I know you're writing a lot, and we're, we're working uh, on some things at the moment, some R&D around LLM, and it's great to hear Charles talk about knowledge graphs, right? I'm we're going to put a pen in that one. <laughs> 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 what next time? We're gonna, <laughs> maybe a whole separate episode. Yeah, yeah, around time. Time. <laughs> yes. Anyway, um, so LLMs then. So can you, for those who have been living under a rock, um, although actually, to be fair, I think even if you haven't been living under a rock and you've seen JetGPT, you probably don't actually know it's powered by, may not necessarily know it's powered by large uh, language models. So can you give us a, a kind of uh, a quick summary of what a, a large language model LLM is, and crucially, what are its failings that we need to sort of worry or concern ourselves about when we're thinking about deploying them into an organisation? Sure. So I'll, I'll go to basics with the large language model. So um, you've got the AI space. Within AI space, you have machine learning. Within machine learning, you've got natural language processing. Yep. Uh, and in natural language processing, you have different models and statistical techniques to do language understanding tasks. Uh, a large language model is usually based off something called a transformer architecture. Um, and so to give some examples, popular use cases in the uh, NLP space, I don't know why I'm looking at the mic. <laughs> 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 Talk to the microphone. Talk to the microphone. <laughs> yeah, there as well. um, so some classical uh, NLP use cases would be things like Entity extraction, yeah. name entity recognition, language um, text summarization, language translation. So the first popular transformer that came out was primarily focused on language translation. Um, this new transformer architecture in large language models is what's enabled these new models to perform so well. I mm. won't go into detail right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah. That's resulted in ChatGPT, which is a fine-tuned version of GPT 3.5. Um, yeah, and so their their main risks at the moment, I think internally, so the more classical NLP use cases, there isn't that much risk. All you're going to see is more performance based off previous techniques. Um, you've got some new challenges, perhaps, such as um, cost or your infrastructure, your data center needs to be bigger and faster to do the inference um, on these models. Um, but I think in terms of governance and risk, there's not much change. Um, where the massive risk comes in, as Microsoft uh, Bing and ChatGPT are experiencing, is public facing use cases. Mm -hmm. um, that's where my particular interest in conversation AI. Um, that has a whole um, web of issues which I'm actually going to dive into. Yeah, I mean, and I guess that's, but let's start to talk about the big ones for LLMs, right, which I think is the potential for reputation damage from getting things factually Correct. incorrect, mm -hmm. right? I think yeah. that's where the biggest worry, and so I think we'll come back to the, how do we kind of put the guy, ca can we cage the, the beast that is the LLM, or will it always sort of escape and cause cause us sort of embarrassment? <laughs> I mean, that, you know, we'll perhaps we'll come, come back to that in a minute. Charles, do you think LLMs are the only example of an advanced model that's going to cause us to scratch our heads like this, or do you see other other machine learning models, kind of and other advanced models coming out that this is going to apply to as well? I think the if you look at the technology uh, itself, right, and how you arrive at it, right, you're actually training on a large data set, mm -hmm. and this data set might be multimodal, right? So if you're talking about uh, DALI, you can draw images, et cetera, from yep. it, I mean, knowing the, uh, the context that uh, that is actually embedded within the, um, within the model itself. You've got audio, I mean, uh, audio channels, and then you've got the, um, the, um, uh, the uh, of course, the uh, text, uh, the, uh, the uh, text uh, um, modality in, uh, in the model. Now, the major challenge that you have, I mean, right now is that this has been released to the public, right? Now, the next, I mean, the next question is, how do we keep the public safe? Right, right. Mm -hmm. So it means that we've released the beast. Now we have to cage that beast, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, that's also yeah. even, I mean, yeah. uh, so it's like that, like almost antagonistic, I mean, like a relationship between uh, the, I mean, the, the 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 two actions will actually drive uh, a lot of this, right? But having said that, deep learning natural language processing and whatever, they are all just a small part of, uh, of I mean, like the whole machine mm -hmm. learning. And it's the tip of the iceberg, right? I mean, it's what exactly. people are seeing and talking about, but actually we've got 
machine learning going on all around us and we perhaps don't always appreciate that that's... Exactly. That's what I find most impressive yeah. about ChatGPT isn't actually even the fine tuning of the model itself, but the infrastructure. Right. They managed to get that running mm -hmm. at such yeah. a huge scale. Exactly. Right. So also the, all, all of these techniques that you say, DALI, ChatGPT, they're all generative models, right? Yes. Which is only, you know, a small portion, a small of, the small portion of the landscape. A small portion of a small portion. And it's mm -hmm. also the probably mm -hmm. portion of the landscape which exposes more of the risks. Yes. You know, if you have analytical models, you know, they're traditionally used in decision support in yes. one way or another. Yeah. Whereas generative models are the ones which are probably more risky because they're, in, they're, they're at the moment not, not totally explainable. Yeah. Yeah. I think you've hit on a key point here, which is we've almost come to a point where we trust they, we trust the computer, we trust data to get it right more than we trust a human being. We're now entering a space where actually it's fuzzier, yes. not fully explainable. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's, it's now in the sort of, it, it's almost like the human sort of error, error rates. And it, it's, it's, I think that's why this needs to be treated differently, right? It's not yes. like, right, I'm making a, a logical deduction based on a SQL query that's going to return me the yeah, same yeah, result yeah. every time I run it. Yeah. And I've got source data here that deter it's deterministic, right? It's yeah, exactly. Whereas this, I, the, maybe, and so maybe this applies to stuff that is non-deterministic and not very easily testable and repeatable and explainable. Yeah. And therefore LLM is just perhaps the first example of that that's come along that's got people talking. Exactly. Yeah. So it's actually looking at how do we refine this to mm. something that is actually better. Yeah. Right. yeah. So it's, uh, I mean, almost the question in, I mean, like in uh, Hitchhiker's uh, Guide to the Galaxy, <laughs> where you're actually looking at, it's the next one that you should wait for, <laughs> right? <laughs> so in this particular case, we've got this, I mean, like this uh, model, I mean, uh, that has got uh, knowledge that is actually uh, not uh, explicit, right? It's embedded in there, it's mm -hmm. recorded in there, you can find it if you're looking for it. Now, the mm -hmm. question is, what was it trained on, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And what is actually left behind? What does it indeed cover? Yeah. Yeah. And how true is the answer, right? Because if you're looking at embeddings, right, or you're looking at um, getting uh, data that is actually within context, it's like, okay, how big is that context? What is the boundary yeah. of that context? Right? And if I combine several sources, uh, which one is the more trusted yeah. source? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So these are things that we need to maybe yeah. explore. Yeah. Yeah, I almost think it's interesting to look at it as, um, you know, we're now building systems which are sufficiently complex um, that they're not explainable mm, in a way, yeah. and, and they're not um, explainable in a, in a programmatic way. Yeah. Um, so you almost have to treat it like a black box at the moment, and it's almost similar to um, like you would have to treat a human agent. Yeah. You know, that human agent, if you think about you, you're in a, in a company, you have a person working for that company, yeah. you have policies that guide them, but they're, in, they're in, an agent who can act on their own. Yeah. And, and essentially we're moving towards something sufficiently complex that an AI agent can, can make decisions that can't be explained, maybe can't be fully constrained by, by all of the rules. And so yeah. what techniques do we apply to, or do organizations apply to control human actors yeah. in, in the way they interface with their customers? Can we find analogs and systemize mm. some of those things to control, very interesting um, comparison. To control a, an AI agent? Yeah. Actually, th th that's, a good, uh, that's a good point, because if you think about uh, content moderation, right, in most cases, we've got the, uh, uh, let's say I, I send my text and uh, I know that, okay, that text might contain something that is actually, uh, that is actually uh, uh, probably harmful, I want to actually remove it, right? Now, I send it, uh, I mean, it's clean text, I send it to, I mean, to uh, uh, chat GPT, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, what I'm asking is, uh, Okay, or not, uh, not chat GPT exactly, but uh, L mm -hmm. an LLM, right? But what I want is for it to draw something, right? Now, my content moderation is based on, is looking at text, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what if it draws something that is actually you now awkward, mm -hmm. right? That means that when I'm building my filters, I have to think about how was this model really <laughs> trained? Yeah, because I guess we're getting out of the stru because when we're in structured data world, we can apply some quite simplistic rule sets around is is that the correct answer? Yes. When you get to unstructured, uh, well, we, it, traditionally the technology world has always struggled with unstructured, right? It's been harder yes. to deal with, and I think we are now banging our heads against this generative problem because it's generating stuff that's not necessarily easily processed by something. I mean, look at OpenAI right now; yeah. they they have an amazing reinforcement um, content filter they've built custom. Yeah. Uh, must be one of the best, like everything they've done. But it's still uh, all the help, the jailbreaks we've seen. Yeah. Right it's today, Dan, the latest one. Yeah. Um, Is this where you get the chatbots sort of take on a certain persona that it's sort of been trained to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I think what we've been talking about, Ollie, we're going to have to have multiple layers of filters mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to have to plug either new algorithms or 
uh, knowledge graphs you mentioned, or yeah. yeah, I think our traditional approaches, how we understand architecture so far, are going to have to change. I think language yes. models are too. And the, if if you think about that, right? So one of the I mean one of the uh, factors for uh, QoS for any service, uh, let's say you go to I mean, go to a uh, to a, um, a, a cash point, mm -hmm. right? You put in your card, you expect to actually get very fast, I mean, uh, very fast uh, service. Quick turnaround, we are happy. Now, imagine if we have to go through all these layers, it means that <laughs> yeah, the inference is going to be... <laughs> so by the time you get to, yeah. uh, you know, to the, uh, to to the inside, <laughs> it's like, I am tired now, I just <laughs> want to go home. <laughs> so I'm going to throw in my first sort of, I mean, back when I was working in this, in this, in this uh, well, first moving this, working in this space, we pushed everything to be asynchronous for that reason. Yeah. Because we, uh, partly because you can scale things up and scale things down based on how much demand you have, and so that's easy to manage. But also, this stuff isn't necessarily able to be processed in real time yep. and get the answer back. So that's where there's the added dimension of how do you do all this and do it in real time? If the customer is there in front of you doing all of that, that's you know you're going to have to take some shortcuts in order to kind of get the performance, you know, the non-functionals uh, to a level. I that, guess that, that, that's only a subset of use cases yeah. where you need that real time. And, and, yeah. and so maybe those aren't the things that you tackle first. Maybe you tackle things first where you, you, they can be asynchronous. I, I exactly my point was like, yeah. start with asynchronous first if you can, because that's sort of, you've got a bit more liberty, I suppose, about how long you process yeah. things for and how much the checks take to, to, to make. But we're diving into some of the solutioning. Before we get there, James, I just wanted to kind of sort of say, um, doesn't MLOps sort of fix all of this problem? <laughs> yeah. so, so I think MLOps is, is part of the solution. Right. Um, so I think what we're talking about here is a more broader view on some of the risks and challenges around this. MLOps, um, to kind of cover off roughly what it is, in, in my opinion, is you know, it's analogous to DevOps. So right. what is that? That is both a cultural change to bring you know, developers and operations close together. So MLOps is a cultural change to bring developers and operation staff alongside machine learning engineers. But it's also, I guess, a set of processes and tools and automation around how you would do that. Like a culture. And it's, Yes, yeah, so yeah. it's culture with supporting yeah. tooling, mm -hmm. um, and I think it's more focused on on the actual models themselves rather than kind of the broader governance around it. Yeah. So if you kind of look at a life cycle for mm -hmm. a model, you would be doing some kind of exploratory analysis at the start, you know, to mm -hmm. identify mm -hmm. data sets, mm -hmm. you know, curate data sets to, to go into a model. You would then actually do some, um, you know, traditionally feature engineering. Obviously, yeah. it's a lot of large language models and stuff. You don't need to do the feature engineering, but you know, generically, you would do feature engineering, data prep, cleansing. You know, potentially, um, you know, labeling of data. You would then, you know, try and develop a model. So you would use whatever tools you want to use. You know, traditionally Jupyter notebooks, things like that, to develop it. Then, once you've got that model, it's how do you get that into production? So, how so do you productionize that? PyTorch, TensorFlow, sort of frameworks, things like that. Exactly. Yeah. How do you yeah. how do you scale it? Yeah. How do you version it? Yeah. How do you QA it? And so and so how for, do you govern it? So for me, MLOps feels like. It's the almost LMOps tunnel. It's the ML tunnel. It's like, how do I get my machine learning model developed and into production? It's yeah. ignoring the stuff that's left and right and up and down, which is what we're talking about yeah. when you integrate this thing into a into an yeah. enterprise environment. I think here lies part of the issue, though, is I think MLOps is going to have to evolve a little bit. Mm -hmm. because I'm assuming most organisations, and we're experiencing this firsthand, are sandbox environments or, or, or Kepler environment is not equipped at all to do any sort of testing on LLMs right now. Uh, because if either you have to three and on an API call, which we can't do for, for data reasons, or our infrastructure and governance just isn't prepared for bringing these models in house, or you know, if most of them are mm hosting -hmm. in face, which again you've got to go through the governance there. Yeah. So there's, there's that part. Mm -hmm. um, this is, uh, yeah. So you touch on tooling exactly. But I mean, at, at the same time, it's uh, I mean, it comes back to. When we're actually looking at, I mean, uh, at MLOps, like what are the triggers? Right, you've got uh, the uh, concept might drift, or you've got the model drifting, or the data drifting, right? Mm -hmm. And you've got a lot of uh, noise, I mean, that is, that is uh, coming in. Now, these large language uh, models have got a lot of noise in them, mm -hmm. right? Which means that we've got a well-behaved, uh, I mean, like a data loop that is actually going in, and uh, we've got this data loop here mm -hmm. with a uh, non-knowledge. And mm -hmm. then you've got knowledge that is actually uh, uh, that is uh, inferred from this uh, like this uh, entity that we don't know. Mm -hmm. So then, how do you define tests that are actually valid in that yeah. context? Yeah, and so, so I think that's the key thing is like what metrics are you going to use? Yeah, um, and yeah, what what levels of those metrics are are um, acceptable or not acceptable in terms of performance of the LLM? 
It's so you've got uh, MOPS pipeline. the the in the MOPS uh, pipeline, mm -hmm. right? So we are looking at okay, when do I know when to actually uh, let's say uh, refine my my uh, my model in this particular particular yeah, case, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So refine my embeddings. Right? So you get your data, I mean, you get your data back. But this model here has got extra knowledge, and also the surface of it is just too large for us to I mean, to actually right. do any meaningful yep. uh, uh, any meaningful uh, test. So when we are looking at uh, the definition of validity, we need to actually be very strict that this is the boundary that we're talking about, yeah. and the definition of that has to be very clear. And so your point about testing, I wonder if that's why you were seeing Bing and ChatGPT limit how many conversation interactions you can have. Because I'm guessing with each interaction, you've got this whole, tr the, the, I can see in my mind, like the, the test pathways, the, 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 mm -hmm. the tree just keeps on expanding, right? So the complexity of how you would test I mean, it, it must increase as the number of interactions with a model kind of increases. I mean, the, the, there is that, but yeah. also because you've got uh, the computation that is actually happening is supported mm -hmm. by hardware, right? So it means that if we've got a lot more uh, people uh, dealing with this, we need to think about the, I mean, the computation, the memory, and also the bandwidth that we're, yeah. that we're actually consuming. Yeah. Yeah. Now, for Microsoft or uh, any other I mean, organization that is actually um, uh, providing these, uh, I mean, these uh, large language uh, models, for them to support support everyone, they have to also support the infrastructure that work to make sure that we get the service as we expect it, mm -hmm. right? So that implicit agreement that I expect that this will actually run fast is actually has to be supplied by someone. Yeah. And in this particular case, it's the companies that are providing these uh, large language uh, models. So it's easy for us, I mean, on the consumer end, right? Because uh, we say, oh, Chat GPT do X Y Z, right? Or it's down, right? But on the other hand, someone has to pay for that model to be hosted somewhere yeah. and to be provided to us in a I mean, in a very um, accessible uh, fashion and reasonable time. I, I think people are woefully underestimating latency, like you mentioned. Exactly. I, had, I was talking to a friend about why can't we use Whisper for speech to text because its, its accuracy is amazing. So we've now reached human level understanding of speech, but it's a Two, three second infants' time, oh, which yeah. obviously in, 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 yeah. in what we're talking about. <laughs> That's ages. We're, we're going to wait three seconds <laughs> yeah. for, and that's just that part, let alone the yes. whole, obviously, yeah. the rest of the pipeline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we're far away. So, so look, I want us to kind of walk through what we, th I mean, clearly this would be a very long episode if we walk, walk through all this in detail, but what I wanted to do was sort of just quickly rattle through some of the errors. And I know, James, you, when we were doing research for, for this episode, you found sort of some nice classification. I, I crudely, dropped it into two buckets but I, I think you've got some, some more which are better and I, I really kind of look at this in terms of what are the sort of more business or compliance sort of risks sort of things like reputational damage which we've already touched on mm. regulatory compliance so things like consumer duty that are coming out from the FCA which I, I kind of know is customer conduct risk from from my mm -hmm. financial, retail financial services days but also the sort of ethics and privacy and the personal data sort of, sort of side of things but the bias that's a big one for me like looking at the answers that some of these things are spitting back out it's clearly based on Unfortunately, the internet is a very biased <laughs> data set to consume. So, if surprise, surprise, you consume the internet, you've got a very interesting. You've got uh, the propriety and legal, yeah. like both image and now language models are like, can we even use that text? So, yeah, so you get the kind of like yeah. intellectual property sort of side of this, the business commercial sort of challenges, mm -hmm. the transparency, the explainability, repeatability. Th that, that's one bo box I put things in. And then there's sort of the technical kind of integration challenges that we've we started to sort of touch on. But I know. James, you came across some more classifications that might help sort of bucket this a bit better. Yeah, so so in, in looking at this, NIST um, have published a reference um, a reference model for for deploying AI in organisations, and part of the pre work to that was a um, essentially a, a literature review of risk models for AI. Mm. So they've done a literature review um, across um, I think an ISO model, an EU model, and and developed their own, and they've kind of just categorised risks into three buckets. So one of them is kind of technical design attributes. So these are like, how accurate is it? You know, so precision and recall. Um, like how reliable is it? How robust is it? So, you know, is it robust to small changes in input? So these are all things that an MLOps pipeline, you would be able to define metrics for and test those kind of technical attributes. Mm. Now, to your point, how well you can actually control those is a separate mm. issue, but you could design metrics to attempt to control those. Mm. There's then kind of another set of like kind of socio, what they call socio-technical attributes, and this is, can it be explained? So if a human was making a decision, an expert, they would be able to say to the person, this is why I've made this decision in, in, a, in, a, in a structured, logical way. Mm -hmm. Now, that's an active area of research, in, in, you know, in particularly around deep learning models, to, to actually try and uncover the model they've internalized mm -hmm. and be able to explain it. So can, you, can it be explained? And also, 
how, how does it interpret the data as well? So explainability is about, you know, say, logically this is what I did. The interpreting part is, you know, where there is wooliness, yeah. how do you then interpret that given a context of a particular case? So, so those, and then, then that touches on privacy as well. Mm -hmm. So how does the model know what privacy to respect? Um, and I guess bias comes in, having said that, human agents can be biased as well. Even mm -hmm. you know, working mm -hmm. in an organization, yep. under an organization's policies, mm -hmm. if you have a customer service agent talking to somebody, they are going to be biased. Yeah. It's hum natural for humans yeah. to do that. So mm -hmm. bias, I don't think, is a new problem, mm -hmm. but it's one where... It's just been magnified, right? Magnified. It's going to be exactly, magnified, yes. right? Because the scale will increase. Mm -hmm. And then I think the last one is broader societal um, notions of trustworthiness. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people are brought up with social values dependent on their culture. If, if we're allowing an AI agent to interact with people, none of that exists anymore. There isn't like the societal norms that it will adhere to and cultural norms it will adhere to because it's not human. It's been trained on whatever it's been trained on. And to your point, yeah. that will have a bias based on the corpus it's been trained on. So, so those notions of like fairness, um, you know, um, ha and like accountability and transparency, like they, they are really hard to, to, to get across how you control those when you have a, a, a sufficiently complex AI agent. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, there's kind of like three levels of risk. The technical ones, I think, you know, there is the beginnings of solutions to those. The other problems, I think it's look at how do organizations control those for their human agents and can we define architectural components that do similar things you know, in a systemized way. So, I mean, you, you've got things like the uh, responsible AI uh, standards, I mean, that are actually coming out by, uh, I mean, several organizations, but is it something that could actually uh, help with, uh, with this type of, um, uh, of uh, problem, trying to actually build a context around it and try to actually uh, solve it? I mean, it's an air, like you've got an area that is actually evolving and uh, also you've got these standards that have to evolve along with it. Totally, yeah. Right. So, I mean, I find it that um, mostly when we are dealing with uh, the uh, human aspects, expectation, right? Yeah. What is expectation? Expectation has got a baggage of context, and the context is actually culturally, I mean, culturally I mean, embedded. So if we look at uh, the fact that these uh, models are mostly trained on uh, the English language, mm -hmm. right? Good point. So we are looking at the English-speaking world. Yeah, yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. even if we try to be very, very generous and uh, say that, okay, that is actually uh, maybe, let's say, 60, 70% of, I mean, of, of, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, the material people, out there. Or yeah. of the material yeah. that yeah. is yeah. actually yeah. out there. But that material does not represent 60 or 70% of the world. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. But also, it's a subset, isn't it? It's sort of exactly. certain, I can't remember what the, the, the name of the data sets are, but they, they include things like Reddit, Wikipedia, and uh, you know, the, yeah. the, there was the, the chap from um, the Atlantic. The editor was talking about there was a little short video that's worth checking out. Because very neatly talks about the main data sets that it's trained on. It's it's still a subset. Yeah. And what was interesting though is that apparently I was reading something the other day that said that if you train something on Reddit, it's like pretty good because there's a lot of human dialogue and interaction in that. I mean, yeah. clearly there's still bias and other things in there, but it it gives you some fairly accurate answers. But for me, my hypothesis in all this is it's going to need a fundamental rethink, right? And yeah. Um, a bit like, and I compare this to, when we went to the cloud to begin with, we just started to try and lift and shift workloads and we had infrastructure as a service, right? <laughs> yes. And then we realised actually, no, that's not really the efficient way to use cloud and we've got problems doing that because we've still got our old baggage of physical you know, equipment, physical uh, yeah. assets. Yeah. We can actually break that down and, and create more flexible capabilities. And I wonder if we need to go through the same sort of mindset shift. Because even myself, I'm thinking, oh, we'll just wrap some traditional logic around the ML. But actually, is that wrong? And that, do we actually even need to wrap the ML model with other ML models around it? Sort Absolutely. of, you know, keep 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 it safe. So, uh, I, yeah, I kind of, Chris, what's your sort of take on on sort of using other sort of things that that reboot of, of thinking? All of the above. Okay. I think uh, filters, logic. Um, James, you mentioned earlier how like feature engineering doesn't really apply to pre-trained models. What's interesting is the whole prompt engineering mm -hmm. aspect. That's kind of feature engineering. It's feeding in a few it's, shots. It's indirect feature yeah. engineering, right? Which, yeah. is, which is new. <laughs> For me, it feels like being a really, really good Google searcher, though. Do you know what I mean? It's like if you know uh -huh. how to how to do the query in Google. At least it used to be in the early days. It's been yeah. refined uh -huh. these days. But like, you need to use the plus, yeah, yeah, the, totally. yeah, the quotes and everything. It feels like that's where we are. Right now, if you're an expert user on an LLM, you get amazing results amazing out of it. Much. If you're lazy and just go blah, 
then you won't. You know, that, that kind of feels like, well, that, that is. You know, in the, in the past, when you actually walk into these uh, large companies, you have, like, they say, Dr. Someone or Mr. Someone who is actually, or who's actually sitting in the, in the corner, and uh, so, oh, that person over there, he knows how to actually do regex. <laughs> <laughs> or Pearl. Okay, <laughs> yes. Right? So you got, you got that guy I mean, who's actually got I mean, like the compendium of actually all knowledge I mean, to do with, uh, with uh, regex. Mm -hmm. But in this uh, day and age, we, with, the, I mean, with the amounts of uh, data that, uh, that we're dealing with and I mean, the way the models are actually changing, we've got I mean, this uh, I mean, generative uh, model, can that person keep up? No. Mm -hmm. Right. So the so if we if we say that okay this person cannot keep up, but what they were, I mean the function that we are performing is actually very very important and it's actually responsible for some of the even best technologies out, out there. So we need to sort of um, redesign that person, automate that person, their or at least their knowledge, and then build systems around that that can expand at the same rate as we actually you know, we are actually uh, developing. But that is actually a research chasing research. At what point does it get into mm -hmm. the industry? And which industries can really take this? What level of maturity do they need to be at? Mm -hmm. So it's not every, I mean, like every uh, company or every person I mean, that can actually jump into this. But that's why I started with the business challenge. What are the business challenges exactly. that are worth solving with this? Because there's a lot yeah. of investment, yeah. there's a lot of thinking that's needed. Yeah. Um, yeah. In, some, in some respect, it's almost a step backwards, though, because you know when you have a system that has you know well-defined rules. Let's say you're working in a regulatory environment. You know the the regulations have have well-defined statements in their contract, and so you can implement that programmatically. Yeah. And then you have something which you you know is right or wrong, and you can test that. Yeah. And you don't have to try and infer what a model's learn to be able to use that model. Yeah. So it's almost like you, you're taking a step backwards in that you may have something which can deal with edge cases better, yeah. but for the, the happy paths, actually it's much harder to use than a traditional yeah. logical decision tree based yeah. model because you can't actually know what it's doing. You have to mm. try and figure yeah. that out and then engineer a prompt to get the output you think you want. Mm. And that's actually a harder task than if you've just got a rules based system in those cases. Exactly. This, think, is what, this is what Charles was saying about, you know, um, can we change our infrastructure to adopt these models? Yeah. It's going to be a bit of both. We're, we're clearly at the bottom of the sigmoid curve yeah. of this technology, but we have to wait. I think organisations have to wait a little bit into the middle, because. Um, sorry, explain the curve. Sorry. So the sigmoid curve. Um, uh, we've got a graph um, on an x and y axis okay. across um, at the bottom, curve up into the middle, okay. and then you curve up over the top. Okay. So it's like an <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. um, the whole point of curve is a better way of thinking. So, obviously, I was on the um, uh, Beyond the Hype podcast. Yeah, because it goes it's a, it's a more yeah. constructive way of thinking about hype. Yeah. Um, if you're at the. Oh, it's like the early doctors, the early majority, yeah, yeah. the laggards, or yeah, yeah, similar. the resistant sort of. Yeah, exactly. Okay, the, yeah. Whole, the whole point of looking at a sigma curve is you've got to ask yourself, where are we on this? Yeah. Is this technology. Um, at the top of the curve, mm -hmm. in which case we're not going to see much change, right. and so organisations can feel comfortable making change in the infrastructure to adopt the technology. Yeah. If the technology is at the bottom of the curve and it's very immature, yeah. we're, be we're, we're better off waiting for the technology to okay. mature for before adopting yeah. it. I, I like this because the, the other way of looking at this is what Gartner called the sort of pace layering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This, hope, this feels yeah. very much like the system of different or innovation. That is even above the system of differentiation, which is then obviously above the system of record, mm -hmm. um, and this, these these things need to sort of dip into and integrate with those layers. I think the the other part to look at it is uh, that if you actually use that curve, right, there are no discontinuities, right. You don't have like I mean, like uncontrolled jumps from one I mean, like one uh, group of understanding into the next. Right. It's such a field of uh, technologies that yeah. are actually mm -hmm. coming. I mean, like, okay. that are smoothly yeah. merging into each other. So I think. It's an easier way for me to actually, uh, let's say, uh, appreciate this, but other than just saying, okay, you're either there or you're there. There's yeah. nothing in between, mm. which is mm. never true. In <laughs> <our case. laughs> no, it's not not in the real world, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, other, the other challenge I'd like to throw out there is cost, because we were talking. You were talking earlier, Charles, about you know the amount of things that the big tech companies are doing to kind of make these things work and make them work fast. This feels to me like it could be out of reach for a lot of organisations. So it's just so expensive. If you think about the amount of compute, both in terms of CPU and GPU and storage and 
bandwidth and so on, it just feels like you know, kind of doing this in a cost managed way is going to be quite a challenge. Right? I remember reading Google search is currently two cents a query yeah. versus ChatGPT, which is 30. Yeah. And that's a, a kind of a hyperscale level yeah. of efficiency, right? Yes. If you're then talking about enterprise kind of deployment, niche use cases. Basically, if you're talking about bringing this uh, I mean, like on, uh, on prem, right, that would be really, really, I mean, again, no. expensive. <laughs> and I don't know like, if there are any project uh, managers or project leaders that would actually uh, I mean, like, say yes to that I mean, like, without... Uh, so you basically got to get cost. comfortable with cloud deployment. You Probably have to be public cloud deployment because you need that hyperscale exactly. access. Absolutely. Now, your cost basically is actually going to be like the cost of bringing in that model from the wild, right? Making sure that you've got all the controls, but most importantly in that path is where does the auditor sit and who owns the information, mm. right? Yeah. So if the auditor is actually looking at this, uh, you know, this uh, model as actually not being uh, well behaved, it means that you have to actually put a cage that is actually well behaved that you can control mm. and with all the controls that, I mean, that go with that so that this beast is only a tool that you know does not behave very well, but you've got a well-behaved I mean, uh, 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 circumference around it okay. that allows you to actually uh, yeah. control mm -hmm. what goes in and what mm -hmm. comes out. Yeah. Yeah. I think ultimately yeah. with a sufficiently complex model, yeah. you need to treat it as untrusted. Yes. Yeah. But you have to treat it as untrusted, and then you have to wrap control yeah. groups yeah. around that to, exactly. um, to yeah. tame it. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. And then it comes down to like also accountability. You know, if you're running that model yeah. and you're accountable, like you say, for it like in the auditor, if you can control it, yeah. then you know you can take some of that accountability and, and on, on take some of that organisational risk. Mm -hmm. And it comes back to the, the point of what's the benefit that you're actually getting from this? Does that outweigh the risks that you're getting? Exactly. Uh, does the business case stack up yeah. for that? Now, building those uh, I mean, like the, those uh, controls, right? we come back to the... I mean, like the uh, the person in the corner, I mean, like the uh, regex uh, expert. Uh, <laughs> if you put a system that evolves very slowly around this, you actually going or you build uh, things that are very rigid around this. The amount of time you have to actually revisit this architecture will be actually. Uh, I mean, so it needs to be great. adaptable and able to kind of exactly. meet the pace. And this has often been the challenge with regulatory GRC type you know, governance, risk, and compliance type things. That they're too rigid, right? They it's a bit like government. Yeah. They're constantly chasing the, the tech innovation and they're going, oh, yeah, we need to put in a law. But they're putting in laws that from technology that was, came mm -hmm. around at least yeah. five, ten, maybe ten years ago because they're still playing catch up. And this for me is where, uh, I mean, Chris, you and I have talked a bit about this. I feel like there needs to be as much investment in dynamic, intelligent, regulatory and compliance sort of mm -hmm. layers as much because otherwise I feel like the, the features and the functionality uh, piece will run way ahead of where the controls and the yeah. and the GRC can keep up. I mean, I was, uh, sorry. I mean, yeah, no, bas no. basically, yeah, you have to actually uh, look at it. I mean, uh, an another way that, let's say, in the past, right, you would do your research, finish, and then beg the industry to actually take your research and uh, I mean, uh, pretty much make uh, make it uh, available to the uh, to the public. But where we are now, you've got research in the public, right? Released to the, I mean, uh, to the uh, rest of the world, and you've got a lot of people with uh, different types of, I mean, of thinking. So anyone, you don't have to actually have a PhD to actually, I mean, to, uh, to, uh, to actually use this model, right? And anyone can actually uh, produce uh, any sort of uh, innovation around this. Mm -hmm. And part of that innovation might be against what you as a company believe in. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So they've got that capability to da do a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. Right. On the other hand, you're looking at, I need to serve my customers very well, right? And you're looking at doing this in a compliant manner and making sure that everyone is actually included, etc. right? Whereas on this side, you've also got these actors that are actually working against you using exactly the same, uh, I mean, the, uh, the same models. Yeah. So if like you're actually... In of, of technology. Exactly. Yeah. So if you're actually in the, uh, I mean, the compliance space, you're looking at both sides, sir. Uh, I need to do this so that I shouldn't restrict people from uh, using this technology that is already in the, uh, in the field. The researchers are telling you, oh, but we've shifted left, <laughs> we've shifted right. <laughs> and then, it, so it's such a, you've got a very, very dynamic uh, environment mm -hmm. that you have to actually catch up with. So it's about knowing what do you leave on the table, 
because you cannot mm. have everything. It's, it's just prioritizing what's the biggest risk. So yeah. we've gone for a lot of different types of breast care, and yeah. you know, it's kind of, I suppose, making um, the investment choices about which ones are you really going to mitigate, which ones you're just going to accept, and you know, the classic yeah. risk management type approach. Can you elaborate a little bit on? So when we're talking about the risk and governance, what do you mean by leaving, uh, leaving what, 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 do you, what do we leave on the table? Yeah. So let's say you've got uh, you know, the research, um, uh, if we take, uh, let's say, the evolution of um, you know, these uh, GPT uh, uh, models, mm -hmm. right? you look at, uh, okay, today I'm actually dealing with uh, GPT. Tomorrow I get Zorro. Right? Yeah, a new model, new model, new model. New model, new model, new model, right? If you're building your environment to actually follow this, right? You're, you're catching up. Yeah. It means that you've got a development team that will be permanently there. If you're looking to actually uh, serve specific, uh, I mean, specific uh, use cases, at times you have to actually look at it that I'll serve this uh, like this use case. It might not be complete, but this com I mean this use case itself is complete for what my customers want and my budget is actually looking at mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. Right? I've got wishes for I mean, for uh, doing everything in the future, or my researchers can actually I mean, can, can look at these I mean, like these uh, models. But as far as my end user is concerned. I serve what my end user is actually worried about, right which comes back to what capabilities actually match the business concerns. Mm -hmm. right? If your environment is about research, then you can do everything, right? You enable access to wherever these models live, right? right? But if you you cannot bring these models in, you can only uh, get public, uh, you know, public uh, access. Your architecture has to support that. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I follow. Yeah. And so I wanted to kind of change gears slightly and talk about a different risk category that um, perhaps people aren't thinking about, which is this, back to my point about the cost of this, this isn't just financial cost spinning up all this, this, this compute and storage, there's the resulting environmental impact of that. And I know, Chris, mm. this is a conversation we had a, a, a few months ago. How much is that on your mind when you're sort of kicking off a project like this, that, that you're significantly increasing energy consumption with some of these technologies? So... I feel really lucky to be at NatWest because NatWest has done an amazing job prioritising um, environment. Alison Rose has made it one of the first banks to actually pivot towards um, prioritising climate and actually investing in being more environmental. Um, I'm trying to talk to a few people in the room with yourself in the bank to actually implement some of the stuff we've been talking about, about both hardware and software costs you know, from an environmental impact perspective. Um, with all that being said, uh, it does still feel like environment and is a is a lagging concern mm -hmm. simply because of the urgency. We, we're we're clearly hitting a step change in capability, yep. and that's always going to be a priority. So it's an arms race, competitive arms race. You, you you don't want to be left behind. You don't want your competitors yeah. to go and do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how you solve that? I, you can you can be mindful of it, but mm. here's okay, here's a challenging question for everyone. Um, if you damage the environment in the short term severely, but you get this new Super AI capability, which which do you pick? <laughs> it's really difficult, isn't it? It's it's yeah. a difficult one. Mm. <laughs> and that, I think that's what we're experiencing right now. These animals are huge and expensive. Yeah. Uh, yep. I think it was two hundred fifty thousand households. Yeah, that, that was that. I think that Christoph, who was on the previous episode, he posted the other day that yeah, two hundred fifty thousand US households worth of energy is used to train. It was it was it GPT? I think it was. Yeah. It? Awesome. Yeah. Or, well, well, they're, they're 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 that size. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. which is a good amount of energy, right? And I think, um, but what is quite uh, refreshing is that we're starting to talk about this and we're starting to at least measure it and think about it because that, mm. for me, is the first step, right? Yeah. You need to be able to measure this stuff mm. before you can then maybe take action. And I guess, again, coming back to sort of cloud, I and mean, one of the other episodes um, that will probably get, have gone out before this is, is um, talking about serverless and, and using cloud in a way that can reduce your environmental footprint because you're only using the compute that you need rather than having servers mm -hmm. sort of spinning there all the time. So going back to the sort of the fact that you need to run this on a hyperscale level cloud you know, uh, cloud provider at least means you're getting some efficiencies and they are, if you pick a, a cloud provider that is making good commitments and using renewable energy and, and those sort of things, I guess that's as much as you can probably do right now is yeah. measure and be conscious and mindful about mm -hmm. what provider and what their what their uh, you know footprint looks like. Yeah, I think you, there there is actually uh, that, but, but you also need to look at it that uh, you need to actually be fluent uh, with the data and the cloud that I mean that uh, that you're you're using to allow you to actually make modifications and changes uh, to your architecture to actually uh, let's say if your goal is actually to minimize energy, mm -hmm. then you need to actually constantly monitor. Can we do better? 
right? Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, if we say, okay, today we're actually using this uh, pipeline and we actually leave that pipeline I mean, as, as it is because the people that actually delivered it have gone and we don't have any of this uh, knowledge I mean, right. about within our organization, then that's something, I mean, it's one way of doing things, but it's about being able to actually uh, embed that knowledge back in so that you can actually make informed decisions as to what, I mean, what needs to change. So it's almost saying that we have to actually be a learning organization. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So it means that, let's say, if we have actually found out that, okay, in our training, we've actually ended up with, I mean, with uh, this uh, huge I mean, uh, energy uh, uh, budget, how do we minimize that, I mean, that, uh, that energy budget? One of the things that I looked at uh, in my uh, uh, former uh, employment was uh, looking at uh, the difference between uh, uh, deep learning, right, and or I mean the uh, current uh, uh, systems to be exact, not just uh, deep learning, and uh, neuromorphic uh, computing. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's actually comparing like the uh, the way we actually process things in silicon, mm -hmm. and also the I mean, the data storage. Mm -hmm compared to how a human brain would actually process exactly the mm -hmm. same uh, same information. So building hardwares that, mm -hmm. that are actually tending towards the mm -hmm. human brain. Because the brain's pretty efficient, right? Very, very, very efficient by comparison. So if you actually look at the processing that we do compared to mm -hmm. like, to, uh, uh, to uh, silicon processing, you're talking about a nuclear reactor in, in, a, in a very, in a very uh, right, small, right. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for very small comp uh, amount of uh, computing. Right. Whereas the brain does it in I mean, like a sub milli or I mean, like a sub uh, I mean, watt I mean, like um, uh, level of, uh, yeah. of uh, um, energy usage. I think Charles, as Charles talked, I think the answer to one of our questions about how you decide between two is what you're trying to do, Ollie, and some of these frameworks are appearing. Um, I don't think people consciously make it as a part of their decision plan. It needs mm -hmm. to be a first class citizen, right? It, right. it needs to be one of the dimensions that's exactly. treated as a first class citizen. But back to Ollie's point, you need to be able to measure it before you can do start to do anything yes. about mm -hmm. it. So mm -hmm. well, you need to have as part of those pipelines, mm -hmm. you know, where you're doing it, it needs to be a dimension you're considering. Yeah. But I, I don't think people are prioritizing like measuring it because it's not a first class citizen in their decision process. Yeah, so that yeah. and that, that's yeah. a that's not a technical problem. That's a cultural, yes. you know, yeah. organizational cultural yeah. problem about elevating it to be a first class citizen. Yeah. So it's like your observability layer has to be actually very robust, I mean, and also be measuring at the correct points. Because mm -hmm. if it's not observable, I mean, exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting we talk about observability of the footprint. We're also talking about the observability and the transparency of the models and yeah. you know, the kind of data and, and the inputs and so on. So mm -hmm. there's some common sort of uh, sort of you know, think think uh, things to think about, but. What I've loved about this conversation is we have managed to, in a reasonably, you know, within, within an hour, yeah. whistle through a number of the, clearly we've just scratched the surface and perhaps I can twist all your arms into doing a, a part two where we go into a little bit more depth on some of them. Knowledge graphs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I want to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. to be good to see, yes. I feel like there's a separate episode just on, yeah. Just kind please. Of, yeah, and it, because yeah, we're, we're doing a lot of thinking on that at the moment. Uh, yeah, it, it, but anyway, um, what I'd like to do now is perhaps just get each of you to sort of wrap up your thinking in this sort of space. It, what are the sort of maybe top uh, couple of tips you would give someone who right now is embarking on, or perhaps they've been given the brief of, Right, tomorrow we need to kind of get this thing up. You know, I'm being silly, right? But how do we get this thing into production? You know, and, and you're thinking, oh, how am I going to manage the risks? What, Chris, let's start with you. What are the, what are the sort of top things that are that you, you, a bit, bits of sort of tips or advice that you give someone? So what I'm personally doing right now, which I, I feel is working really well, is two parts. One, taking some experience from the aircraft engineering space, okay. which is designing with the end in mind. So mm -hmm. you're not eternally chasing the latest model. Okay. So maybe take a little bit longer to get to production, mm -hmm. but trying to build a bit more robust architecture, maybe identify parts that just don't exist yet, okay. and go, right, let's look at them. Right. And that's what the, um, what the Blackbird was designed for. Oh, OK. Um, and then getting governance, I'm, I'm pitching the governance and risk with the end in mind. So I'm not trying to pitch the latest use case or like, like how you do three, I'm like, what would a human agent, uh, what would an AI equivalent human, uh, human level AI agent look like? And, you know, that's still probably five, 10, 20 years away, but if I can start getting a framework in there, that makes any new updated model coming much easier to get through, because yeah. you now have a more more robust, tougher uh, framework that you're working against. Mm -hmm. So basically what, what these language models enable us to do is actually think about endgame. We're now like, what's the final solution? But like, 
And that's what I'm saying for personally, and that's what I recommend. Okay. Charles? No, basically, uh, much uh, also in the, I've uh, been working with these uh, larger language uh, models among other things. But uh, what I'm actually looking at is, I mean, in addition to what uh, Chris has actually been, uh, uh, brought up, I'm actually looking at um, the fact that you're actually working in a uh, in an environment that is highly regulated, mm -hmm. right? which means that your boundary is actually already set, right? So it's looking at which capabilities do they, I mean, do the uh, regulators actually uh, uh, care about, and then how do they match the use cases that uh, that we are actually bringing in, so that when we are looking at uh, uh, let's say the uh, the inclusion of these and of these um, uh, regulatory uh, concerns, we are actually doing it in such a way that we go, we know that they will change, right? Okay. So we actually build an architecture that is actually flexible, mm -hmm. dominant to change, adaptable. and uh, yeah. it is adaptable. Mm -hmm. And also the gap between what is expected and what is actually uh, what is there is actually known. So it's about that observation uh, for that I mean, how we close that gap, and also actively making sure that that gap, how we close it, we actually do it in a flexible way that mm -hmm. will allow us to actually okay, we can actually take that model, I mean that model out, yep. replace it with another model, and it, it yep. is going to work, and we know that it is still controlled. So you're talking about some good sort of architectural sort of thinking, like you know, sort of abstraction and um, decoupling and all that sort of good stuff. So so, so it sounds to me like applying good sort of architectural best practices even more needed in this space where you have uncertainties and things that need yeah. to evolve. And so, James, what, what would be your sort of points of, of note? Um, so I guess, yeah, very similar to, to what Charles said, but I think the first one we don't underestimate the challenge. Okay. Um, like, it, it, well, look, we just it's, it's great and it's shiny yeah, and it's yeah. new, but like, I think for, for people looking to adopt this, particularly in regulated industries, don't underestimate the challenges that it will bring. Uh, I would say engage with stakeholders and even external stakeholders, regulators, yeah. early mm -hmm. in the process. Agreed. Do that as a white box, not yep. black box exercise, mm -hmm. because um, in my experience, regulators won't be resistant to that. They will have concerns, but if you bring them on the journey with you, Absolutely. you're yes. much more likely to get success. So engage wider. Yep. And I think my third point would be, um, although it's likely you're going to be using a model that's provided by a third party, don't assume that that doesn't need, you need real deep expertise in-house. Mm. Build the capability in house, your machine learning and AI capability in house, rather than just assuming you're going to procure a model as a service from exactly. someone else. Um, because ultimately, you will need that. There will be times where you need to understand and, and look under the covers, and understand what things happen to be able to control it properly. Mm. Yeah, I don't um, think your governance team will like, oh, just trust the company we're using the model from. <laughs> 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 and what models are they using? Oh, the neural networks. Oh, oh great, great, great. Yeah. Yeah, we do. <laughs> No, I mean, it's like you're actually talking about uh, a technology that's not uh, easily uh, explainable, mm -hmm. right? So... Explainable the model itself, but the technology itself is hard to understand. Exactly. Right? Yeah. You need yeah. super niche so expertise. Yes. Multiple yeah. layers of complexity. Multiple yeah. layers of, yeah. uh, uh, of uh, complexity. And also, if you're talking about uh, maybe energy concerns, uh, etc., then you need to actually start looking at things uh, or the contribution and attribution is actually, is actually very uh, important as well. Mm -hmm. That you know what contributes to what. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. if you're going to actually measure, you can measure the whole world or you can measure your contribution to the whole world. Right? So you need to actually know your domain and yeah. uh, also mm -hmm. you can influence maybe the outside world but do your part. That's the most important part. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Well, look, this has been a fantastic conversation, which I suspect that it would be. And I, like I say we've only scratched the surface, so it would be great to kind of go in, 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 in on a part two at some stage. Mm. Um, but look, hopefully, this has been uh, a, a, a useful episode for those of you listening and watching. Um, do check out the, there's, there's things that all of us are sort of writing in this space. And Chris, you've got what, how many part series you've been writing on? It keeps uh, growing. <laughs> <laughs> I need a managed scope creep. <laughs> Um, uh, so yeah, there's there's there's, there's content from, from from Chris. I think you've been publishing your newsletter as well. Yes. Is, it, is it know thy data? Know thy data. Yeah. So it's <laughs> actually yeah, yeah, I make noise. I'm gonna go on there. So yeah. So yeah, so Have do, a look. So yeah, do check out everyone out on, on on LinkedIn for the content they're putting out. And uh, yeah, with that, thanks very much for for your time. If you're not already subscribed, do go and subscribe on YouTube and on your favourite podcast services as well. Um, and with that, uh, look forward to seeing you and speaking to you again in the near future. Thanks everyone. Much appreciated. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you.